Right. I have to go and talk to these people now. So you, you can sit down there. Yes. I'll be back in five. Courage, you stay there. He's gone. Today we are doing what has been probably the most hotly anticipated review of my subscribers. The Sony 35mm f1.8. And we are going to be comparing it up to obviously the Sigma 35mm 1.4 art lens. Now one note to start in case you haven't already spotted it, this isn't the native Sony E-mount version of the Sigma 35. This is the Canon EF mount version and the MC11 adapter. Now with this particular setup compared to the Sony E-mount version, the size and weight remains about the same. The image quality stays exactly the same. The only difference between the native version and the adapted version is the autofocus is slightly more responsive with the native version. Now the first obvious difference, the size and also the weight. This is one of the biggest reasons why I wanted a 35 1.8 over a 1.4. When I first came to Sony, I had a fleet of Sigma 1.4s. I had the 24, the 35, the 50 and the 85. I switched the 24 art to a 28mm f2. I switched the 50 art to the Sony Zeiss 55 1.8 and I switched the 85 art to the Sony 85 1.8. And this is the final piece of that puzzle. Now, where the Sigma 35 weighs in at 665 grams, this weighs in at less than 300. So it is less than half the weight of the Sigma. Boom. And it's considerably smaller as well, at almost half the length, which means it takes up a lot less room in your kit bag. It also has a smaller front filter of only 55 mil versus the 67 of the Sigma and has a closer minimum focus distance of 22 centimeters versus the 30 of the Sigma. Both lenses have a selector switch for jumping between autofocus and manual focus, but the Sony has the advantage of having a programmable button that the Sigma lacks. In its defense, even though the Sigma 35 is technically a DSLR lens that's just been modified onto a mirrorless body, it's not particularly unwielding it's not massively oversized compared to native sony e-mount 35 1.4s from both sony and samyang this is a fairly average size for that but the sony 35 1.8 just fits the system so much better it's so much nicer to carry around and isn't as obvious for when you're trying to do street photography now me and the family recently took a bit of a break from things and went on a cruise around the Canaries. But you know what they say, you can take a photographer out the country, but he'll still take his camera with him. So whenever we stopped and got off the boat, the majority of the time I took the 35 with me because, well, I wanted to test it out. And even walking around the streets in temperatures far exceeding what I'm normally used to, this didn't tire me out one bit. Image quality wise, all the pictures look pretty sharp. One thing that was particularly impressive I noticed about this lens is the really minimal amount of chromatic aberration. Even on this fountain shot that was shot at f1.8 with the water droplets spouting everywhere, there's a few minor spots of purple there, but really nothing particularly insane. And even up in the corners in the trees, there's very faint signs of purple fringing, but again, nothing particularly concerning for a fast prime lens that was shot wide open. Now comparing up the Sigma versus the Sony side by side, you can see that in the center of the frame wide open, both lenses are pretty sharp, but in the corners, both lenses start to lose that sharpness, the Sigma more than the Sony, but that's kind of expected given that the Sigma is a 1.4 versus the Sony being a 1.8. Stopping both lenses down to f2 renders an increase in sharpness, but the Sony still remains ahead of the Sigma. And what I found is that through the entire aperture range, the Sony is equal to or ahead of the Sigma. Now, in terms of vignetting, this is really the Achilles heel of the Sony. When testing both lenses with in-camera corrections turned off, you can see that they both show noticeable amounts of vignetting at their widest aperture, but the Sony's is a lot stronger at 1.8 than the Sigma is even at 1.4.
Now the shading in the Sigma pretty much clears up by the time it gets to about f4. The Sony never really clears up, even all the way down at its minimum aperture there is still a bit of difference between the corner and the centre of the frame. However this is where I did notice one interesting thing regarding light transmission. With both lenses at identical settings, the centre of the Sigma always appears slightly darker than the centre of the Sony. Suggesting that while the Sigma might have a faster aperture on paper, the actual light transmission and t-stop value is worse. Now both lenses also show distortion when in-camera correction is turned off. The Sigma has some slight barrel distortion, while strangely, the Sony appears to actually have some pin cushion distortion. Now arguably, vignetting and distortion aren't as big an issue as they used to be. With the advancement in sensor technology and the introduction of in-camera corrections, most of the time you never actually notice anything there. The build quality of the Sony, well, it's not really surprising, it pretty much mimics the Sony 85 1.8, i.e. it's a mixture of thin metal and plastic to keep the weight down, so it doesn't feel as solidly built as the Sigma, but then there's got to be a trade-off, do you want the build quality or do you want the weight? Now in fairness, I know from experience that even though the 85 1.8 isn't built as strongly as the Sigma lenses, it can still withstand a drop from 4 feet onto concrete because I did it. Now in terms of autofocus performance between the Sony and the Sigma, this is where things are going to be slightly skewed because this is an adapted lens, not the native. To test the tracking capabilities of the autofocus of this, I put it to the most ultimate test that I could, I had Rusty running up and down the garden while I tracked him running back towards me. And again, I found that while both lenses did an okay job, the Sony did a better job of keeping Rusty in focus, and when there was a pause or a delay while it tried to fix it, the Sony was still the faster one to respond to it. In terms of autofocus noise, the Sony is damn near silent. Even when I put a microphone right up to the side of the barrel, it wasn't able to pick up any audible noise at all. The Sigma is slightly more audible. If you're shooting stills, it's not exactly going to cause distractions, but for video, it will get picked up on an internal recorder. Now, like I said in fairness, you have to take those results with a pinch of salt because it's not a native email lens. However, where I have seen people compare up DSLR versions of the Sigma lenses to the native Sony E-mounts, the general consensus is that the autofocus is a little bit smoother, especially for video, but there's not a huge difference. So I imagine even if you compared up the native Sigma lens, the Sony would still match or exceed it. Now one other thing I noticed about this lens as well, so even though they're both advertised as being 35mm lenses, there's a bit of discrepancy between them. Which is pretty normal for lenses to be fair, when I compared up the Sigma 85 art to the Sony 85 1.8, I noted that the Sigma wasn't as long as the Sony. And I'm seeing exactly the same thing between the 35s, the Sigma is actually wider than the Sony. In terms of out of focus renderings on the Sony, again, there's nothing really to complain about. No, the background blur is not going to be as much as a 1.2 or a 1.4, but what it does produce at 1.8 does look pretty smooth and isn't particularly distracting. Now, which one should you buy? The Sony 35 or the Sigma 35? Well, let's see. We've got two lenses that are fairly similar on price, except this is almost half the size, is less than half the weight, has just as good if not better image quality, has far superior autofocus and isn't two-thirds of a stop darker as you might be led to believe. It's a close call isn't it but I think I'm gonna go with this one. If you like this video please consider subscribing to the channel for future content. If you want to support my channel further there is a link to my Patreon page down below. As always guys if you have any questions or queries the comment box is down there as well. Thank you so much for stopping by and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.